And then he was so uncomfortable that he said not a single actual word to me. Mm. He was just sort of like, ha, hmm, yeah, ha, hmm, all sort of onomatopoeias. And then proceeded to sneeze on my leg uh, like 50 times in a row. I'm not exaggerating that number. It was, it was like 50 times. Hello, my name's Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. So before anything else this week, I need to come clean, hold my hands up and say sorry. When I was originally arranging to have the conversation with this week's guest, comedian Johnny Walker, he had said to me, quite reasonably, well, actually it would be good if I could talk about the whole Toronto scene because there's so many memories and everything's so interconnected and it would be really good for me to kind of talk about why it's all important. And I said... No, no, we're not doing that. We have to pick one venue, we have to focus in on that venue and we have to talk about that for the two hours that we get together. And he said, okay, fine, cool, I can get on board with that. And he chose a venue which was The Steady in Toronto, which you might actually remember because we featured it last year when I spoke to owner Keaton Cash in the episode titled I Own a Fucking Hot New Queer Bar. But that's all by the by. So we got together, we sat down, we talked and then we didn't really talk that much about the study so yeah that's why I'm holding my hands up I'm saying sorry to put you under all that pressure and then just take you on a wild goose chase of a conversation but it's a good one I mean we talked about a lot we covered a lot of ground and I think you're not going to be disappointed so in amongst the strange conversational cul-de-sacs that we venture down we talk all about dates that go on and on and on why Johnny took the time to come out to everyone in his life individually over brunch most times and Johnny kind of comes clean and lets us know that he's the person that's responsible for all of these hen parties clogging up the gay bars. Why don't we get into it? When, when I was coming up in, in Toronto, there was a big divide between, you know, the sort of the neighborhood spots uh, on uh, around Church and Wellesley that were the more kind of traditional mm. old school gay bars, and et cetera. And then in the west end of the city, like there were all of these more sort of alternative spaces that were popping up. And at the time, it felt like you you could really choose. It was like, do you want to be a Church Street gay or do you want to be... A West End gay. Oh, so what is your philosophy on this? Do you have to pick a side? Can you be both? Well, okay. See, here's the thing. It's like at that moment, and I remember because I am um, also uh, I sort of like at one point like accidentally co-founded this male burlesque troupe that is still around uh, 15 years later. Yeah, I accidentally did that one. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. And I, yeah, so I like host all their shows and there was this one show that we were doing and we had like the gall and we performed it at Pride at a venue that was in the village, you know, right near Church Street. And we called it Dead Sexy, a funeral for Church Street. And it was just, it was so rude. And we were just sort of like, whatever, the neighborhood's over. And now all of like the places that we think are cool are in the west end of the city. And we had this whole performance in it that was about this like new gay in town getting off the bus and being fought over by... The two factions. Yeah. Yes, by the sort of like preppy uh, Church Street gays and these like hipster... West Toronto gays. And then that culminated in him sort of like emerging as this new, uh, like mega gay who encompassed everything and just, I don't know, was kind of dressed as that era of Lady Gaga, essentially. So that was sort of, I guess, the sort of 
nonsense that was rolling around in my brain at the time. Now, by today's standards, it's like we don't have any of those spaces. Every single one of them in the West End closed and Church Street is still alive and kicking. So I'm like, can you, do you have to choose? Like there isn't much of a choice choose. if you, but so just to, you just, can't really just choose. Just like dig into the plot of this piece. <laughs> Were you saying everything is for everyone? Was that the message I'm to take away from that? I, you know what? The dramaturgy on that, there were a lot of cooks working on that particular routine. The final message of it, I guess, was saying, you know, something about maybe like, let's not have all this infighting. But then it was also maybe that just sort of like, if let's you're dressed. Let's fucking make a baby because then they'll end up being the best of both of us. Maybe. Or maybe it was just sort of like, if you wear like a good enough outfit, you can just do what you want and you go where you want. Swish between and then... <laughs> Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but you know what? I, I would say that I still think to some extent there is, I think even though all of our, all of our spaces pretty much are gone, I think that like West End queers do still exist in Toronto. And I think... It is, it is a bit different. I don't think you have to make the decision and be only a West End person or only a True Street person. But I think for a lot of people, that decision does get made. And I do know people who, if they're going out, would only go to events in the West End or would only go to events on church. Mm. And I, I maybe I've become that baby because I'll go to events in both now. I, so I did become that <laughs> Lady Gaga baby myself. I don't know why they were dressed like Lady Gaga. It was the time. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm not really sure then what position you're in. You can be both or you have to pick a side? No, I think you can be both. I think probably I am both. Okay. You are the personification of both. I'm the personification of both. I think at the time I was pretty decidedly West End. And why is that? I remember being in my early 20s and... Coming out, which was something that was, I, I, I felt at the time a little old because I was like maybe sort of like in between like 21 and 22. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was about a year long process that was around that age for me. And yeah, it was, a, well, it was still that thing though, where I had, I mean, I'd gone to an arts high school. I had definitely had friends who were out and doing all kinds of things in high school, but it was still, I think, an era where when I look back on it and I think about the queer people from my high school, like most of us actually probably came out sometime in like undergrad. Uh, there was still a lot of that. So I feel like I was a little late, but not super late. But anyway, I remember being, being a young person and going and being like, okay, so now what you do is you go to church street and you go to these bars mm -hmm. and you, you know, meet your future. And I went into those bars and I felt like I was not meeting my future. I don't know. I just remember going to the more, uh, you know, mainstream mm -hmm. gay spaces and not liking the music, not liking the vibe, like feeling really um, like I wasn't attractive enough or I wasn't the right kind of attractive or I wasn't dressed the way I was supposed to be dressed mm. or I was like weird I don't know I just I wasn't making friends I wasn't like having any sex I wasn't oh. like it just wasn't working yeah. for me yeah I was like I don't I don't get it wait so this was it. like within the first five minutes of being there yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like it was like I was like where's where's my boyfriend is this supposed to just sort itself out why is out? no one filleting me uh hello yeah. <laughs> why hasn't nobody asked me on a date I'm very cute. And then I think I just, I, I remember going to places like the Beaver and the Hen House and Nako and being like, oh, like, I feel instantly so much more at ease in these sort of dive bar uh -huh. spaces that uh, are all sort of, you know, made by artists and are these sort of strange hybrid spaces where, you know, they would be like, there's an art show going on on the walls and there's poetry reading tonight and there's going to be a dance class and a comedy show tomorrow night, depending on when you come. And there'll be a dance party, even though this is clearly just like 
an old diner and there's not room for it, but it's going to happen anyway. <laughs> so that mm. was that was the milieu I was looking for. Okay. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm making a decision. I'm going to be this type of gay. It was just like, oh, I fell into it this way. I think I was in the process of trying to, you know, discover like what kind of gay that I was. And I think for me, it was more that just, it seemed like, there seemed like there were more possibilities for that exploration mm. in in this part of the city, which was also, I don't know, where a lot of my friends were living as well anyway, uh, versus, you know, when I had been to, and, you know, probably like a pretty cursory tour of the, the church street bars, but I was like, I feel like, this particular journey of self-discovery has a dress code and has like some pretty rigid expectations of what like my body should look like. And you know, what level of fabulosity. Yeah. That I was, I was sort of like, I don't know if I can be my authentic self here. Mm. But very interesting and very commendable that you didn't then go, Oh, how do I contort myself in order to fit in? Is it? I don't know. I just, I think it was more that I was like, I don't think I could pull this off. I don't think I convinced anybody. There's not even any point in trying. (laughs) Take the compliment, take the compliment, bloody hell. Um, (laughs) So you might have seen me scribbling down before when you mentioned that it was a year long process of coming out. Mm. I don't want to just let that go by without asking follow up questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why did it take a year? Is that unusual? Do you think that's long? I don't know. Is that weird? Is it weird to say a year? Yes. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> okay. I guess I'm sort of, you know, I'm going on like when I told the first friend that I told as the beginning and like when I told my parents as being the end. Okay. And I think that like that took about a year, maybe a bit less than a year. Oh, uh, okay. So you went to theater school. Yeah. But it wasn't until you were 21. Yeah, so I was already, like, sort of finishing up my undergrad at U of T. Better timing would have been, like, at the beginning as opposed to at the end. But, you know, (laughs) I waited a little bit longer. Does that mean that you assumed you were heterosexual or you just were like, I'm not going to address it? Uh, I think it was, like, very sort of very like deep denial. Like I would say I was not like out to myself Mm -hmm. and it was a real sort of like, uh, it's crazy. It's like the, it it was, um, it was insanity. It was, you know, having this really. Are we using like the clinical terms insanity or you just, (laughs) it was a bit silly. No. When I just think about the sort of like the, the mental backflips that I was doing Uh and having, you know, I don't know, having on the one hand this sort of like very clear understanding where I'm sort of like, okay, well, I'm exclusively like masturbating to gay pornography every day, which is a pretty big indicator. But then, you know, the second it's over, you delete the browser history. We kind of pretend that that didn't happen. Oh, And then, you know, go back to whatever and then you know your friends are like oh like who do you have a crush on and i like here's my ready answer for who that is and it's all false but then i don't know he's just i'm like no this is like this is crazy this is a crazy way to behave okay so my first follow-up question is what were your search terms when you were looking up the porn oh so embarrassing (gasps) oh I mean, I remember going to a few specific websites, um, one of which I think it was maybe a French website. It's also just, you know, it's just a different era of pornography on the internet, right? Okay, don't worry, don't worry. I'm not going to grill you. Let's not. You, you do not need to defend your pornography choices to me. No, well, it was called The Best of Harry. I'll admit it. The Best of Harry? The best of Harry, yeah. Oh. Like H-A-I-R-Y, not like a person named Harry. Um, oh, like Harry? Yes. Oh, okay. Like, like, like body hair. <laughs> yes, like a hairy person. Oh, oh, I'm sad it's not about Harry. <laughs> just wild about Harry. <laughs> uh, I think it was all just like uh, images. That was just, this sort oh, of would be this roundup that was like, 
refreshed on a pretty regular basis. And it would be like... A random hairy man. Yeah. And it would be sort of like, here's, you know, today's top 10. And there would be sort of like, these are the ones where they're wearing denim. Or they're smoking a cigarette. Or all of these specific activities that they could be doing. A lot of the, like, activities not necessarily something sexual. And you were getting off to this? I mean, to the naked hairy men, yes. I don't think, like, whether or not they there was, like, a denim jacket in the background or they had a cigarette in their mouth wasn't particularly <laughs> affecting it, but... Oh, no, I just mean, like, just pictures of men. It's just not enough. Really? I actually I still like pictures. <laughs> oh, okay. I, um... I this broken. I'm a pictures person. No, there's... Do you know what? I think, um... Like, erotic photography leaves more room for my imagination in a way that I really like. Oh, yeah. I don't want to fill in the blanks. I don't know. I feel like if I can linger over a single beautiful image of a naked man and sort of, you know, zoom in on the bits I want to zoom in on, it f- I feel like it makes my brain feel more like that person could be, like, in the same room with me and I could touch them. In a way that watching a video feels like this is something that's happened that I'm just watching that, you know... It has this, I don't know, there's a, a different layer, oh, a level of remove that photography, photography somehow feels more intimate to me. Uh, okay, sorry, I didn't mean to take us on this pornography <laughs> route. The other follow-up question that I wanted to ask you, and just so I can uh-huh. get a better sense and understand, you talked about when you would answer your friend's questions around who you fancied, you would always, like, talk about some woman. And... Some woman, just some woman. Um, And in that response, did you yourself think, oh, yes, I do fancy this person because you were so deeply lying to yourself? Or was that just a name to blurt out in order to get through the moment? I think uh, both at different times. Ah. I think there were times where, you know, especially I feel like if my friends got invested in the idea of like a crush that I had, you'd hit a point where like I was kind of invested too. Oh, um, so you weren't like trying to come up with reasons for why that crush dissipated. <laughs> oh, I saw her picking her nose. I <laughs> I remember, you know, a couple of times asking a girl out on a date in high school and getting rejected. And I was like, oh, but like getting rejected from asking someone else, like it still hurts, even if yeah. it was a sort of... Yeah. I was like, that's still sad. But 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 was that the conversation you were having with yourself at the time? Like, oh, I didn't actually care, but that still hurt. Or was it more like, oh, I'm unlovable, blah, blah, blah. I remember there would be times where it was like this voice would come into my head uh-huh. and sort of intrude and be like, if I was sort of sad about something like that, I would sort of hear this voice in my head being like, why do you care about any of this? You know that this is all fake. And then I would just be sort of like, la, 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 not listening. Oh, like, wow. I would like really like push, push that out of my mind. Yeah. And so what changed? Like, w- when did you get to the point where you were like, oh, do you know what? This voice, it might have a point. I remember this one night when I kind of got the flu or something. <laughs> <laughs> this apartment I was living in <laughs> and I was just kind of like rolling around and having like real like I don't know I get such like fever brain when I'm sick right like uh-huh. my mind is like racing and going through all of this stuff and I think the defenses were down and so I think that voice came like screaming out of my head and I was just sort of like sweating and tossing and turning in bed and just sort of being like what are you doing like you know that like you you're really gay like you know that like you you just like want some dick like what what's the big deal like just fucking get over it like and i remember just sort of like being so sick and uncomfortable and just sort of rolling around in bed being like it's true i do like want some dick like so that's, that's what i want <laughs> so you're sick with the flu saying to yourself i just want dick just so yeah. we can paint the picture here <laughs> Yeah, that was the fever that made me gay. Wow. Do you know what? Something I I do think sometimes when I think about some of my friends, especially I had one friend in particular who came out when we were in grade nine and I feel like just like really went for it and was like dating and having sex and we were like 14 and he was just like so ready for it. 
And I was like, that's so brave. At the same time, like, he was a really good looking kid and girls were trying to date him all the time. And he had like had all these girlfriends and he'd been on all these dates. And then he had like gone off to summer camp and he had gotten a, like similar attention from guys. And I feel like he had like really been able to compare and contrast and be like, hmm, I can tell like which of these is for me. I don't know. I feel like I wasn't, I wasn't as cute in high school. I don't know. As I said, I was asking those girls out on dates and I was getting no's. So I think I still had that sort of like for a long time that I was like, well, maybe I just, you know, haven't really, can I say no to this if I haven't really been able to pull it off or like give it a try? And it wasn't until university that I was in situations where women were actually like coming on to me or, you know, would make out with me at a party and I would be like, oh, I feel oh, I feel nothing. nothing as this <laughs> happy. I feel nothing at all. I could be making out with like a loaf of bread right now. Like it's just... Multigrain or white? <laughs> just Wonder Bread. Just <laughs> I fucking love Wonder Bread, I have to say. Something about... Anyway, sorry, that's not what we're talking about. You, you would make out with a loaf of Wonder Bread. I would, I would, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the margarine get really go to town so this moment of reckoning with yourself mm-hmm. awakening from the fever and being like yes my calling penises yes how long then did it take you to, to have that first conversation with someone about it i think i mean um, it was with my roommate at the time and i think it probably was within maybe like a few weeks of that Mm -hmm. You know, I remember sort of like really trying to work my way up to it and and sort of planning for it and then trying to find the right time. And we were very close. We were we had been friends since high school and we were living as roommates. And also like it was a thing where I was like, this is like the safest person because we're such good friends. And also she was straight, but had just always been so into queer people and I was like I feel like I know like you like prefer queer people like you will you will like me more with this information and yeah I know that you already are someone who has my back so she's not weirdly fetishizing queer people is she no I think she's just like was like a fun like down to clown ally you know okay. so someone who's sort of like oh yeah I've been, like I'm like going to drag shows in high school and like she just knew stuff okay, you okay, know okay okay So she's not one of those people that like approaches you in the bar when they're really drunk and says, I love gay people. Can I be your friend? No, no, not at all. No. And this is someone who's like still a dear friend to this day. Who's just, it's just someone who's with it. You know, someone who gets it. Okay. Uh, We were very close and we would often, she had this um, big, beautiful bed and all this like really comfortable bedding. And often at the end of the night, we would just end up like in her bed, like gossiping together and like talking about like, you know, what was going on in our lives and stuff. And I remember like, I kept like hanging out with her in her bedroom and trying to like work out the courage to tell her. And she kept fucking falling asleep (laughs) and like three nights in a row when I was like, I'm trying to uh, tell you some important things. That's like the perfect opportunity to practice. Practice saying it in front of her. I think the final time I was sort of like shaking her and being like, hey, Stay awake, please. Listen, I need you here with me. <laughs> <laughs> and how did the conversation go? Oh, it was like totally weird and embarrassing um, in the way that, I don't know, I feel like almost any any conversation I had like that like went so strange, at least at first. Uh, I remember even, it, it was it, it was like vocalizing it was felt really hard. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't just say like, I'm gay. Like that was... Uh, that was really challenging at the time. And I remember just sort of like, I had to whisper it in her ear, even though we were in her bedroom and there was nobody else there. I even like the way that I phrased it, I was like, I don't like girls, I think is what I said. And she was like, I think she thought that I was maybe saying I was like asexual. And she was trying to sort of interpret the information. Uh. And then I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get it twisted. <laughs> he was like, no, but very much liking boys. And she was like, oh, okay, yeah, makes sense. <gasps> makes sense. Then she was, yeah, she was all in. It, it, it makes sense in this context, like, oh, yeah, of course you're a total fag. Or, or <laughs> like, I, I understand the sentences you've just put together. Oh, I think both. Because oh, we okay. also, I remember, had several conversations where she had told me that, like, people 
would ask her if I was gay and like oh, would often assume that I was. That was her way of broaching this subject with you. And she was like, oh, it's like, it's a good thing. Like base, she was like, honestly, like that just means you're not an asshole. Like she was like the best thing that like could happen for a man would be that like someone assumes he's gay. That just probably means he's like not a terrible person. <laughs> so, so she was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like that tracks. This has just triggered something for me. I'm just going to like quickly change yeah. the subject. Someone said to me the other day, they were talking about someone else. They said, oh yeah, he's my favorite beta male. And I was just like, why would you say that? <laughs> like what? Do you categorize, do you have a favorite alpha male? Like what? Anyway, that's just a nothing. You don't need to comment. That... <laughs> No, I don't really like that. Yeah, I just felt really like, what are you, what, why would you say that? Honestly, that also just all of the alpha, beta, omega stuff sends me to this bad, like, werewolf fan fiction place from my old job anyway. That's just. <laughs> Wait, what's an omega man? <sighs> oh. <laughs> Should I just do my own research? <laughs> um, so you had that conversation. Did that make you feel emboldened? Sure. Yeah, of course. Then why did it take a year to get to your parents? Sorry, that that I worded that in a very judgy way. Sorry. (laughs) Like you're so unimpressed (laughs) with the amount of time that I took. I don't know. I was busy. I was in school. I was doing shit. Like you know, I really found like the process, like it was time consuming coming out. There were so many people I had to like have conversation. I had a lot of friends that I have to be like, hey, we've got to like go up to lunch and have this whole, oh, it was exhausting. Wow. That is exhausting. I don't know. That was maybe like nobody else does it that way. That was how I did it. And I was like, this fucking takes a year. This is how long it takes. Yeah. Well, I mean, your Rolodex <laughs> is obviously more full than mine, but I like <laughs> totally just wimped out. I was just like, yeah, I'm out now. And then didn't really tell anyone. Just, like, let them assume based on how outrageous I was. I don't even... What did you... What was the coming out then? What was it if you didn't tell anyone? Well, uh, it's just, you know, start talking about, like, oh, I'm going to this bar on the weekend when someone asks you what you're doing. Or you just, like, say, oh, I'm hanging out with my boyfriend. Although that's not true because I never had a boyfriend. But, like, just start normalizing it in your behavior in your language oh, wow. without actually saying to someone i need to let you know this oh i didn't know i didn't do that at all i like sat people down i sat people down like i had a, like i had like a state of the union with fucking everyone and it would just it took a long time well it was exhausting okay. yeah, that is emotionally draining like working your way up to that. it was but were there particular points that you hit every time when you were giving that speech <gasps> do you remember the speech can you give it to me now can we role play? Oh my god. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do No, do you know what? I think it came out pretty different every time. And I think I remember trying different angles on it. Oh, okay. And I remember that there's just the sort of the the coming straight to saying like I am gay. I still I had a really difficult time like saying those words uh-huh. for a long time. I just like I couldn't I couldn't get that out. So I would sort of dance around it. And I remember at least a few times I would, there was like a, a, a boy from my school that I had a crush on. And that was sort of, I was like, I introduced it. Like that was sort of the way in. I would tell a friend that like I had a crush on this person. But then that was always kind of confusing too, because they would be like, oh, so like, are you telling me that you still consider yourself straight, but you have this like one special thing. I was like, no, are you stupid? Like, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. And then I would, I, I would always like end up having to say it anyway. So like after a few times I was like, we've just gotta, we've just gotta say the thing. Listen, before we order drinks, I'm gay. <laughs> but even just like, I don't know, you, uh, it's, it's strange now. I think like maybe with like the, the version of myself that people see today and they'll, they'll be sort of like, how were you possibly even like not out at any point? And it's like, I don't know, blame the culture, blame like the conversation where it was at at the moment. People weren't clocking it. I don't know. But literally I remember one time like being with a friend and being about to tell her and then she like fucking kissed me. And I was like, what's happening? Like what? Well, like, what? like snogged you. 
yes. And then she was like, oh, like, I really don't think we should go any further tonight. And I was like, yeah, no, obviously. We, like, <laughs> same page, sweetie. Like, where did, what was that? Oh, did, did you hold off telling her that night? Oh, I had to. I had to because she was, then she was like, I've just spent a year living in Berlin surrounded by only like gay men who didn't view me as like sexually desirable. And I was like, I was just like, if I tell you this now, it's going to just like, it's going to seem so cruel. So you did then. (laughs) I... No, I saved it up. I was like, she'll hear this one through the grapevine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so so that story aside, uh, as you were progressing, you said that you had to just get more and more at forthright in telling people. So by the time you got to your parents, yeah. were you just like, hey, yo, gay? I said homosexual. I was like, this. the language has got to be clear. <laughs> I was like, I am, this is going to be like a legal document. Like, we're just going to like, there's not going to be any ambiguity here about what I'm saying. So, okay. So, and that's how the conversation went. I, homosexual, me go now. <laughs> well, you know, we, I was hanging out at their house and that episode of AbFab came on where Safi like comes out to Eddie just sort of out of frustration. And she's like, oh, hurrah. And then she's like, oh, like I'm not actually gay. And then she's like so devastated. And I was like, this feels like a sign. So, so yeah, I don't know. I told my parents and my mom was kind of surprised. My dad was not surprised. And then like when I think like they were offended when I was like, I started telling people about a year ago and they were like, a year? Why weren't we the first to know? (laughs) And how do you end those conversations? That's the weird bit, right? That conversation specifically ended, like, in the middle of a conversation, my mom was sort of like, well, what did you think we were going to, like, give you your, like, childhood rubber duck and kick you out of the house? And I was like, what's the rubber duck got to do with anything? (laughs) And then, like, at the end of the night, as a sort of, like, wry joke, she, like, got the rubber duck and gave it to me and was like, I'll get out. And then afterwards, I was like, I feel like you have just been wanting to get rid of this duck. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a bit of a like when clearing out like your old junk. Oh. Anyway, I still have that dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So over that year in coming out, uh-huh. you started going out on the scene. Yeah. And yeah. and this is when you had your like, oh, am I the village? Am I the West End? Mm-hmm. Moments. Yeah. Well, and you know what? I remember like going out in the village, just not having a great time. And then like when a straight friend of mine, this is so ridiculous. At the time she was kind of a big deal on live journal. And <laughs> oh, do we need to knew... explain what live journal is? I feel like we should. <laughs> it's just a blogging site, right? Like you just blog. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it was, it was blogging. It was sort of a social platform. I believe now it is owned by a Russian company and I tried to access my old life journal and they were like, we will not give you your password Aww. back. You cannot have your journal. So I don't know. Someone in Russia is delighting over my entries from those days. Feasting on your tales. <laughs> but yeah, I'd been complaining to her about how it had this sort of like difficult time. And so she like reached out to the live journal community and was like, where should someone like my friend go to like have a nice like gay time in Toronto? And like live journals advice was like, oh, go to the Beaver. Like it seems like maybe just like the church street scene isn't quite for you. And like, you should go to the West End. So I took, I took the advice and I was like, oh yeah, no, this is, this is much more my vibe. And what were the ingredients that were present for you to make that decision? Like to just know? Uh, I don't know. I think that, Things were so, it felt just relaxed and casual. Uh, I liked that it was this sort of like dingy kind of DIY dive bar space. It felt just sort of like artsier and I don't know. It just like seemed more like the people that I knew and was friends with, like where we would go. And, you know, there had like... um, Miserable Mondays, I think they called it, where they just played like Morrissey and the Smiths and all this stuff. And I was like, 
oh, that's so weird and stupid. And I, I love that. And, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then several years later, I had a friend who was working there who sort of was under the mistaken impression at the time that I was a DJ and I, I wasn't. <laughs> and so he offered me like a monthly dance party at the Beaver. And I said, yes. And like went home and Googled like how to DJ. <laughs> and that was the beginning of, uh, you know, my illustrious uh, nightlife career that continues to this day. Um, so yeah, the first time I ever DJed was at the Beaver doing this party that I made up called Sissy Boy Hissy Fit. And I would like design a poster for it every month. I would do a photo shoot with a different friend who was going to be like the Sissy Boy of the month. And I would print them uh, at Northbound Leather, the like leather shop in the village. They like had this like little printing shop and I would bike around like putting up these physical posters <laughs> for a dance party in this, you know, tiny little cafe with this postage stamp dance floor. I didn't know what I was doing, you know, but I, I, it was a place where I could kind of cut my teeth and figure it out. The first date that I ever had was also at the Beaver. And I was like, I didn't know what I was doing, but you know, it it just felt like. First date, first date. (laughs) Wait, first date ever or first date at? Yeah. First, first, first date ever. (gasps) Yeah. First date ever was at the Beaver for sure. Uh, and it was like a brunch date. Um, During the day. <sighs> yeah, it was, and again, it was a terrible date, really. Oh, brilliant. And it was so long. Tell me more. But so long. It was like 12 hours. <gasps> and that, did you, did you have this? This was a real feature for me in my earliest days of dating. They, they would be so long and we just didn't know what to do or when to call it quits. Like I, this was, I think I've had maybe two or three dates with this person. They were all quite excruciatingly long. They would be like, you know, 10 hours long, 12 hours long. And there would be like, not even a kiss. And I was like, what, what's happening? Why are we here? Okay. Well, let's break this down a bit. So was it that you knew that there was no kind of vibe going, but you maybe stayed to see whether that would pick up? Or is it that you just I didn't, think no. Help me understand. I think I was trying on my side, like really hard to like put a vibe down and be like, I'm open for business. Like what what the why are we here? And I don't know, but it wasn't And because you were impatient about like dating and like finding someone to date, or because of that. Yeah, because I, I mean I felt like I, I felt like I was behind, you yeah, know. Okay. I was like 22 and I was like, we've got to just get yeah, going you were here. Be- yeah, you were behind, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we, we got to pick up the pace. And it was just a thing. I mean, had we went for brunch, we went for a walk. And I feel like it was just like, maybe we like went for dinner or like went to a comedy show. Just kept going and going and going, but, but going nowhere. <gasps> and, and were you expecting him to make a move? I was trying to sort of get like a mutual move going, but I was just not, I was just never getting that yes and, you know? Like I was Mm -hmm. like, I maybe not like being super aggressive in my pursuit here, Mm -hmm. but I'm also like, I don't know how to do this. So Mm. I'm trying to get, find someone to like meet me halfway. Did you ever do the thing where you kind of like just stand a little bit too close or sit a little bit too close to them and then like are brushing up against them? Oh, of course. No, I was doing all that shit. All that shit. Classic. All of the moves. (laughs) Even at one point, like we were like walking around and it was, the winter and it was just this like freezing cold day with like snow and wind and I remember like taking his arm as we were walking and I was like this is a date thing this is like some physical contact I don't know what and did he recoil or no he went for it but that was it but then he just kept wanting to hang out and making you know we I went out with that guy three times and he just kept like wanting another date. And I was like. And you'd call it a date? What? Yes. Oh. Yeah. And then you just never kissed? No. And now that man is your husband. <laughs> 
Do you know what? I did see him one time many, many, many years later at another defunct West End <laughs> gay bar <laughs> called The Holy Oak, where they were having a live piano karaoke night. And uh, my friend Gislam was, uh, he, it, it's, it's crazy what he would do. He would be like, it's Kate Bush night. I'm learning every single Kate Bush song <laughs> to play on piano. <laughs> and he would, you know, have like, a hundred songs that he'd learned. Wow. And there would be this big list and people would just, and he was like, I want to sing all of these songs tonight. Like everybody just like, keep going, keep going. And it was packed and I had put in, you know, I was Hounds of Love or whatever. I had my songs in the list. And then this guy came and sat down next to me on this bench. And it was like him and this woman, they shot up at the last minute. And oh, I think they immediately like were suddenly first up and they just butchered Babushka, did like the worst, this like in absolutely insulting rendition. I was like, who are these people? And he sat down right next to me and it was, it was the summer, he was wearing little shorts and I saw on his thigh this big um, like VHS tape tattoo. And I was like, who's this person with this massive tattoo of a VHS tape? And then I like looked up at his face and I was like, oh my God, it's that fucking guy from those never ending dates from a million, from, at that point I was like, te- from fully 10 years ago. And then the girl he was with like introduced herself to me and she was like, hey, like we're having so much fun. Like, have you met my friend? And I was like, I might have. Yeah, actually I, I know him. And she's like, but how? And, and I was like, yeah, we like went on some dates about, 10 years ago and then she just kept hugging us and being like happy anniversary you guys <laughs> and then he was so uncomfortable that he said not a single actual word to me hmm. he was just sort of like huh hmm, yeah huh, hmm, all sort of onomatopoeias and then proceeded to sneeze on my leg uh like 50 times in a row i'm not exaggerating that number it was it was like 50 times on my bare leg just sneezing <laughs> <laughs> but, but okay so th- like how did it end did you did you dump him is that why he was being all funny uh oh no like i feel like he dumped me oh because it was it was this funny thing where like we would we'd met on I don't know, some kind of app or something, maybe on OkCupid, something Mm. like that. And he was, I found much more flirty when we would talk online. And then in person, he was like kind of standoffish. I I was like, I don't know how to interpret this because it seems when we're chatting that like you're, you're interested in me, like you're being flirtatious with me. And then in person, it's like, we're just having these really long hangouts (laughs) that I'm like, it's like, even if we were, we're hanging out as friends, like I don't hang out with my friends for like this 12 hour stretch of like, I I don't know. I don't know what to, to make of this. And the final date that we had, I think it was the third date we went dancing at this place in Kensington called The Boat, which also doesn't exist anymore, um, with a bunch of his friends. He introduced me to all of his friends. Oh, We went out dancing. That's weird. And there was this moment on the dance floor where, like, we were actually sort of, like, dancing together in a way that felt like a, just even, like, had a smidgen of sexiness, like, where I was, like, we're vaguely having a free song right now and then the second it happened some like drunk straight girl threw her arms around us like a stranger and was like oh my god are you guys on a date you guys are so cute and she fucking ruined it and i was just like staring daggers at this like do you know like how many hours it's taken me to like (laughs) get to this moment and you're gonna come and ruin it and I don't know that date it sort of he went off with his friends and I went home and I don't know they wanted to go to a house party or something it's just it wasn't a good it wasn't a good date and and then that was it he ghosted you well, no, we were talking online after, and I said, I was like, you know, that was kind of a weird night. Uh, and I tried to sort of bring up that moment, and I was like, I did, like, enjoy dancing with you, though. And it was like, I thought it was a shame that that girl interrupted us. And then he was like, I have to let you know that, you know, I'm not really interested in you romantically, but I hope that, you know, 
you can be he said something so weird he was like i want you to be like one of my top friends that i hang out with all the time <laughs> and then cut to 10 years later i'm <laughs> like saying on my like 50 times at the kate bush night yeah i would say top friends that he hung out with all the time <laughs> didn't 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 quite happen for him but well, i mean you know his definition of that might be different to yours yeah I feel like that's like a, a weird, a weird thing to throw into um, letting someone down gently. Well, I also just I find it I find it so confusing when people like break up with you, but they want to say something nice to you, or like just any kind of situation where people want to say something nice to you to like lessen the blow, but it actually just ends up confusing you. Yeah, I mean, I know, like, the, like, I hope we can still be friends is a classic, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, because I take that seriously. I'm like, oh, you want to be friends? Okay, great. But I know I shouldn't. But the now. specificity of, like, I would like us to, to not only be friends, <laughs> but be, like, top friends who hang out all the time. I was like, what? If it was today, I would think it was chat GGP. <laughs> even the structure of the sentence sounds weird. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's that. That was that was. Uh, but so, that was that. okay. That was that day. So you'd spent all this time coming out, and then you went out. You spent you like spent at least thirty six hours invested in like not even getting a kiss. <laughs> Tell me you got a kiss yeah. at some point. No, no, <gasps> absolutely not. Ever. Never. No, it was like driving me. I mean, oh no, like, no, I mean like yes, oh, in no, my no, life no. from like, other people. This guy <laughs> side, yeah. Like this guy, move on. Like did 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 you get a kiss like after that? Soon after that, did you get to practice? Oh, I think I had actually, like, I had had kisses before that. Oh, okay, good. It's okay. like I'll stop feeling sorry for you now. Yeah, <laughs> I had been kissed. But just specifically from that person, I was like, where, like, this is a long time to invest for not even, like, a peck, you know? I, well, you've got a lot more patience than me. I'd be like, I'm out of here. I'm not doing this. I don't know, but I hadn't been on a date before. I was like, I guess this is what they are. <laughs> this is what they do. <laughs> well, better get ready for my date. 12 hours uh, in the calendar. <laughs> I had nothing to compare it to. Um, we might have gone off topic. We've gone far afield. Yes. Because I feel like you were asking me, how I started doing events at the Steady, and I don't think I've quite answered that question No, yet. no. We didn't get back there, but I can answer that question. Okay. Because there is an answer, and it's, you know, I, yeah, it started going to events at the Steady when it, when it opened. I was aware of it as a space, and I knew that, you know, you could go, they had a comedy night, there would be film screenings, but I was mostly going at night to go dancing and have a drink or whatever, sometimes for brunch. And I was, so it was 2015, I was turning 30 and I wanted to have like a big 30th birthday party. And I was like, what's a place that I could rent out or get a room in that would be fun um, to do that at? And I, I decided to do it at the Steady and I had this like lip sync party. I called it lip sync for my life. And I just made everybody, (laughs) all of my friends who came had to prepare a lip sync (sighs) performance and perform it in my honor. That sounds hideous. Did anyone refuse? A couple of people insisted on like singing live instead, (laughs) even though I was like, I specifically, I was like, I don't want you to. I want you to do like a lip sync. Um, Wait, and you chose the songs for them? No, no, no. They they oh, chose okay, the songs. Okay. They could do whatever okay. they wanted. Oh, that's a bit better. It was really fun. It was a fun <laughs> night. And that, I think, was sort of like what sort of, even though that was, you know, that was like a private event for some friends. And we did it early in the evening so that Keaton could still throw like a public dance party after. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we stuck around for it, though. I think we like went back to my apartment or something and just hung out. Um, but after that, I had sort of in my head like, oh, this is a really fun spot to book for certain events and I think because they have the big space in the back but they had this sort of you know bar in the front that looked really cute but you would go through this hallway and then there was this you know Mm -hmm. big space that you could do a lot with and that you didn't have to decorate very much because the way that it was everything was painted and set up was already so colorful and pastel and you know dreamy and fun 
And so later that year, uh, a friend of mine was getting married and I decided to book the space for her bachelorette. And I know there's like a lot of controversy about hetero bachelorettes at the gay bar. Mm -hmm. And I have contributed to this problem multiple times for like throwing my friends <laughs> bachelorette parties at the gay bar. So but you're the person we have to take this up with. Then. I'm the problem. <laughs> We've got to hold it against you. Yeah, okay, good. As long as we know. But, you know, I think the, 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 the straight girls that I'm friends with are a good time. And I was just like, this is just a good space to do this event. And so my, my friends who was getting married at the time... Um, she was the person who I had gone on tour with, uh, and had done all these, we had this theater company together for about 10 years. And when we were in Edmonton one year, she met this guy out there and started dating him and ended up like marrying him, having a baby, moving to Alberta, eventually splitting up with him, bringing the baby and coming back to Toronto. So the marriage itself was not particularly a success, but I would say the events around the way were really <laughs> fucking fun. So it was this hard thing, whereas, you know, like my best friend was getting married, but that also I knew kind of meant the dissolution mm. of this theater company that we had worked so hard on. And like I said before, I had always sort of thought of when I would sort of think about years, I was like, well, what shows were we doing that year? And that's how I sort of like remember where I am in time. And then I was like, oh, but we're not doing a show this year because like she's moving away and getting married. So I kind of like all of that level of creative energy that I had, I threw into this <laughs> bachelorette party that included like a 90 minute floor show that we had set up that I wrote this script for. I had a friend who was like a, was a big burlesque host that we'd worked with a bunch um, perform in drag as her and co-host the show with me while I was dressed up as her then fiance, you know, <laughs> like ex husband. And so we had this whole gag that we were like, we were actually mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And that when we saw them in the crowd, we were like, oh, look, there's like Johnny Walker in a disguise and some local drag queen. And they think they're being so cute showing up here and making fun of us. We insisted that like we were the real ones and that they were the fakes. It's very stupid, very meta, very ridiculous thing. And I remember at the end of the night, Keaton came up to me. He was like, I think like there should be more like fun performances like this in the space. You should do this again. And I was like, there's no way I could possibly like, <laughs> make something as insane as this ever happen again. This was absolutely a one-off. But part of the other deal of that was uh, we wanted to stick around after and have a party and, and then like dance. And Keaton was like, well, can you just make it something that we can open to the public and mm -hmm. promote to people? And all of the people who are at the party can stay, but then we'll just, you know, start charging cover and, let the general public come in at like 10 o'clock. And I was like, okay, sure. We'll, we'll figure that out. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to throw a party that I think would be fun. Cause at that time, you know, it's a couple of years later and I have been DJing for a few years at various different spots. And I was like, well, I can, I can take care of this. I can DJ the party. And what would be fun for me to do. And I know that my friend would really enjoy is if I did a party where I played sort of hip hop and R&B, but female artists only. So that was the idea. And then we made a Facebook event for it and we just put out some listings and we're like, hey, if anyone wants to come. And we did it and, you know, with the intention that it would just be a fun party for our friends and for, for my friend who we were celebrating. And then as soon as it was 10, suddenly all of like these chic fashion forward lesbians showed up, you know, all sort of looking in my mind, they all kind of looked like a sort of like cute fashion androgynous Archie Andrews style, like a lot of bow ties. <laughs> and they like loved the party and were like, yes, we're here for this. And the party was so much fun and it was packed. And at the end of the night, Keaton was like, oh, can we do this as a monthly? Like this event really worked and I was like yeah I mean it was a total 
accident. I was not trying to build something to last, but I mean, I have the playlist now and I think I like playing that music and if people like Mm -hmm. listening to it, let's kind of keep it going. And so over that little while, we would, we would do the party at that at the time for that first year, it was called What You Know About Me, which is reference to the song Lip Gloss by Lil Mama. And it was, it was just, it got, you know, bigger and bigger and we would, we just had such a good time. And yeah, the party just, it really grew there. It really became what it was. And we had a Halloween event that was, it wasn't the final night that the study was open, but it was in the final weekend. I think it was the last Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And there was maybe another event on the Sunday or the Monday. And it was like, yeah, we threw like the last rager that happened in the space. Everyone was in costume and it was just, it was really magical. We had a huge show that like went on forever and we tried to bring back like all of everybody's favorite performers and the people who had been a part of this thing that we had built. And I mean, now it's, it's, it's seven years later and I, I have moved on to other venues, but I'm still doing that event. It's still going. Mm-hmm. And we were also, I, I realized that I had hit on this thing I guess so much of this is like accidental for me, but I love a happy accident. Whereas like, oh, because the name of this event has the word girl in it. And because the visuals for the event have never been the way that so many like gay events are, are just, you know, sort of like the, some like muscly Mm -hmm. man's naked body, right? That kind of accidentally, we created this space where I think like women and non-binary people and trans people like felt more safe Mm -hmm. and that it has always been a bit more of like a mixed gender crowd, which I love. And it wasn't me coming in and being like, this is what I'll do Mm -hmm. intentionally, even though sort of like philosophically, like I am more interested in like a, queer events and spaces that are fully inclusive and that are really for everyone and that aren't just these sort of like siloed off situations. So maybe on a sort of subconscious level that that was, I was drawn to that, but I, what I can't claim that I was like, had some master plan there. It was sort of, it was a happy accident from, uh, from day one. I was like, wow, like all of these cool lesbians are at my party and I don't see that at a lot of the other parties I've been to and I'm really happy about it. And I want to keep that going. And, you know, at its best when we would do that party and I would just see everybody having like a wonderful time or especially when we would do something like Halloween and everyone would, you know, come in a costume and have this like look that they had put together. It's just like, Uh, Seeing everybody like put in the effort and be so happy to be there and be like, yeah, this is where I'm spending my Halloween. This is where I'm spending like my pride Saturday night. Like this is the, this is the one that I've chosen. It's just like, it's like a real honor. And it's something that I like, I take seriously. There's a lot of options. And so if you've like chosen my event, I'm like, I really want to do my best for you, you know? Do you have any memories of the study or maybe clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, this is your opportunity, so why not tell me all about it? I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing, but I can't do that alone. I need your help. Go to lostspacespodcast.com, find the section, share a lost space, and then tell me what you got up to when you went there. I'd really love to hear all of your stories. And if you're not quite ready to tell me all of the gritty details, but you still want to get in touch, then you can do so via Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, where I can be found under the handle Lost Spaces Pod. 
Find out more about Johnny by visiting his website, johnnymcnamarawalker.com, or following him on Facebook, Johnny McNamara Walker, or on Twitter, where he is Handsome Johnny. Handsome, handsome Johnny. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you took the time to subscribe, leave a review on your podcast platform, or just tell other people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. My name's Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.